generous introduction, and thanks to Kai and Christian as well for being part of inviting me to, to, to do this talk today. It's a real honor to do so, and I'm really happy to be here. And let me also offer my, my thanks to the university as well for, for helping to sponsor this conference and providing this tremendous facility that we're in here for, for, for this particular talk. Uh, I'm, I'm impressed uh, at how far this particular meeting has come in the 10 years. Uh, I've seen a number of these, these conferences. It keeps growing, it keeps getting better and better, thanks to people like Agnes and, and the schools that, that help sponsor it. So we really appreciate it as part of the organization and, and the profession really benefits from, from this sort of thing. Uh, so thanks. Um, so what I thought I'd talk about today is, is uh, what I'm calling the changing face of publicly traded corporations, which is essentially just saying that uh, the characteristics of companies that, that make up the publicly traded universe, and I'm going to be talking primarily about U.S. companies, but I think there's, there's mounting evidence that similar sorts of uh, trends are taking place internationally. Uh, the, the characteristics of companies that make up this, this publicly traded universe have really changed quite a bit over the last 40 to 50 years or so. And I think that's pretty well documented at, at this time. But what I'm going to argue is that the, these sorts of changes in the way companies invest, in particular, specifically uh, investing in intangibles, uh, has had some profound, uh, has had profound implications for, for different uh, patterns in corporate financing. Uh, specifically, the nature and the distribution of profitability Within, within companies that are publicly traded, how they go about raising money to undertake these investment opportunities and intangible assets. And I'm going to talk at the end a little bit about some implications that, that I think it has for how we do research in, in finance, particularly corporate finance, but I think there's some implications outside of the corporate finance arena as well. Right, so, so one way to, to start is just uh, what I've done here is just list the 10 largest companies in 1970 and, and, and 2016. Uh, and this is listed, I'm measuring size here by market capitalization. And, and I don't think there's a lot of surprises as to who they are at these different points in time. Uh, but a couple of things jump out, I think, and these are things that, that, that others have recognized. I mean, one is that the industry composition of who's really doing well, who's the largest players in, in the capital market has, has changed quite a bit uh, away from sort of your traditional all-line manufacturers, you see some energy, energy firms and some retailers as well, uh, to companies that are much more of the, of the high-tech and service variety. Right? So I think that's been, that's been recognized uh, quite a bit uh, among scholars in finance and economics uh, what I want to focus on is if, if that's the nature of the, of, of the industries that they play in, uh, how do they spend their money? Right? What do they invest in in order to generate uh, these market caps? Uh, and in particular, the extent to which they, they invest in intangibles as, as key factors of production as opposed to your traditional capital expenditures that are, that are of the bricks and mortar uh, variety. Right, so, what exactly do I mean by intangible capital? And I think uh, one, one breakdown that I particularly like uh, from the paper that I've listed here is to separate out these intangibles into three, into three categories. Right, one you can think of as, as knowledge capital. So these are investments that are going to produce a certain type of knowledge that is either going to expand the set of investment opportunities that the company has or enhance the, the existing opportunities that, that in existing lines of business that they have. So R&D would be a prime example of that type of uh, investment in, in an intangible. Right, the second broad category is, is sometimes referred to as organization capital. Right? And I tend to think of this as, as primarily investments in key personnel, key human capital investments. But you can also think in terms of enhancing the, the company's products, brand name, or enhancing the relationships with, with key customers, all of these things would be uh, 
items that would go into the category of organizational capital. The third category that I'm calling uh, information capital is a little different from knowledge capital in the sense that it's just an investment in how the company will process information within the firm in a way that presumably will ultimately enhance value. Right, so these are all investments that the company can make that produce valuable assets, but these are not assets of, of a, in a traditional sense. They're not tangible assets, but they're creating value in, uh, in a more intangible way. Right? Now, I think for what I'm going to talk about, there's, there's at least three important differences between tangible and intangible investment. One is, is, is sort of a simple accounting difference. Okay? How these things get recorded on the financial statements of, of, of the company. If you think of uh, capital expenditures being made as traditional bricks and mortar sort of tangible investment, right? you may be taking cash out of the company, investing in a hard asset, nothing's changed about the total assets of, of, of the company. Right? Over time, this gets expensed in, in the form of, of depreciation. Intangible assets, are if that's not the case. Intangible assets are primarily expensed right up front. I don't know that about r and forever, but a lot of these other types of intangible investments that I'm, that I'm talking about tend to show up in the selling general administrative expenditures of the public company. So this SGA part of the income statement right, is reflecting the investment in, in intangibles. And that's going to have an impact on some of the the profitability numbers that I'm, that I'm going to show you in, in, in a bit. Right, so I think that first point is pretty well appreciated and has been for, for a while. Right, the second point I think is a little is a little more subtle, a little less appreciated. And if you think about how these investments tend to scale with company profits uh, and sales, traditional tangible sort of investment scales in a roughly linear fashion. Right? You, you build a new plant or you expand a warehouse when you have a pretty good idea that demand for your product is, is there. Right? And so as these expenditures accumulate over time, they're accumulating in, in roughly a linear fashion with, with the subsequent sales and, and profitability, and, and there isn't much of a lag between those two. Right? That tends not to be the case with intangible sorts of investments. If you think about companies like Amazon, who have done lots of intangible investment over time, that type of investment has to accumulate quite a bit for a long period of time before you see any positive profit or, or even uh, positive sales. Okay? And so they're going to scale in a very nonlinear fashion. It's going to look very flat for a while, uh, and then there's going to be a big payoff if you survive okay? eventually. So that nonlinear scaling is also going to have an impact on some of the profitability numbers that I, I later show you because companies that are doing a lot of intangible investment are going to be showing lower profits and they're going to be showing lower profits for a while right, until they're ultimately successful. The third part is going to have to do with, with some of the discussion of, of corporate financing trends that I'm going to mention. And that's simply that these assets that you invest in as intangibles cannot be pledged in the same way that tangible assets can be pledged as, for example, collateral right, in a, in a, in a finance, finance of contract in sort of sense. Right? So it's going to be, in some ways, more difficult to raise the money to undertake these, these investments that, that are required in, in, the, in the new economy sorts of, of firms. Right? So I mentioned before that right, there, there is evidence that <coughs> The nature of investment has changed a fair amount over time. So let me just sort of depict this in a, in a couple of ways. And I'm certainly not the first to download these numbers and show them to you. But if we look at traditional capital expenditures over time, right, we see that you know, they hover in the, in the 8 to 10% range right, in, the, in the 70s, the 80s, and even into the 90s. And we've seen over time sort of a gradual diminishing of capital expenditure rates. This is capital expenditures divided by, by book assets. I know this gets criticized sometimes in, 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 the, in the business press as saying, well, companies are not investing like they should or they're buying back to too many shares at the expense of investment. They're usually talking about capital spending uh, when, they're, when they're talking
talking about that. But that's clearly just one part of, of investment that, that companies are undertaking. Because if we look at some of the intangible components of investing, they're really moving in the opposite direction. Right? R&D expenditures have grown quite substantially over time. And as I mentioned, a lot of these other intangibles show up in the SGA component of, of the income statement. Those have grown even more than R&D over time. And I'm going to show you later that they've had a big impact on some of the other patterns that, that uh, exist in terms of, of profitability. Right. So, so why, why does this matter? How does this matter at all for, for, for what we do in, in, in corporate finance? I, I'm going to argue that, first of all, it has a profound impact on profitability patterns that, that exist in there. I'm going to talk a bit about some work that I'm going with a co-author, Steve McKeon, at the University of Oregon. Right. Secondly, as I mentioned before, it's altered quite a bit the manner in which companies go about raising money for this particular type of, of intangible investment. Right. And then third, I want to talk a bit about other implications that uh, fall into the category of uh, maybe we have to think a little harder about how to conduct some of the traditional sorts of tests that we do in the corporate finance realm, given, given uh, some of these other patterns. All right, so let me talk about profitability first. I mean, this work with, with Steve McKeon that, that I mentioned, what we've documented is that over this period of time in which you've had this large growth in intangible investment, <laughs> All right, operating losses have become far more pervasive among U.S. public companies. Right? They're a lot more persistent over time, and they're, and they're much bigger in magnitude as well. And they're tied very closely uh, to, this, to this investment in intangibles. Right? So let me just show you some of these uh, in graphical form. Right? If, you, if you focus your attention on, on, on the top curve, what I'm depicting here is a percentage of, of U.S. public companies that, re that report negative operating cash flow in, in a given year. Right, so this is not net income, so there's no special items that are subtracted out. It's actual operating cash flow. Right, so if you look back in, in, the, in the 60s and 70s and even into the early part of the 1980s, it's very rare to find an individual year, despite going through many recessions during that time, it's rare to find an individual year where more than 10% of the companies in that year exhibit negative operating cash flow. Right? Once we hit the mid-1980s, mid that changes completely. Right? So if we're looking at the most recent couple decades in the sample, it's, it's normal to see roughly 30, 35% of the companies in any given year showing negative operating cash flow. Right? That's a fairly striking number. Right? One third of the companies in any given year have negative operating cash flow. Right? What's also changed is the persistence of those operating losses. Right? What I'm showing here is, is a conditional number, conditional on having negative operating cash flow this year Right, how many years in a row have you now had negative operating cash? And so this is a metric that's bounded below from one by one. Right, and you can see that in the early part of the data, starting in 1970, right, that, that number hovers around one and a half. So there's roughly speaking a 50-50 chance of having positive operating cash flow next year if you had negative operating cash flow this year. Once we get out into the 2000s, we're looking at a median run of three to four years of, of negative operating cash flow. Right, so the operating, they, I think having negative operating cash flow is a lot more common, and conditional on having it, you have it for a much longer period of time. Right? The third part of this is, is the magnitude, and I'll show this by just simply showing the distribution of, of operating cash flow relative to total assets for the publicly traded universe. So in the 1970, this, or this is really the, the all firm years and the whole decade of the 1970s, it's a roughly normal distribution that's centered around uh, 10 to 15 percent of, of total assets. And if we if we layer on top of that the 2000s, you see this fairly sharp shift to the left. So obviously the mean rate of profitability has declined and many authors 
authors have, have shown that. Right? What we're really interested, Steve and I, is, is that left tail. Right? What that's saying is in, in the 2000s, 5% of the firm year observations have negative operating cash flow that's at least equal to 50% of the book value of the total assets. It's a huge number. Right? When you layer on top of that the persistence, uh, you're talking about uh, a, a, a fairly dramatic shift in, in profitability patterns. What's also different is if you look over time at the companies that have negative operating cash flow, they exhibit very different characteristics. You look back in the 1970s, you see a lot of characteristics that look a lot like what you'd expect when I say they have negative operating cash flow. They're financially troubled in some way. Right? They have high levers, they have low market to book ratios, they have negative growth rates and sales or employees or, 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 or pick your number. They're not doing well. And that's why they have negative operating cash flow. In the 2000s, that's totally different. Right? The companies that are exhibiting, at least on average, the companies that are exhibiting negative operating cash flow tend to be high flyers. They have high market to book ratios. They don't borrow a lot actually because they have intangible assets, so it's difficult to, to borrow. And they're actually showing pretty strong positive growth rates in, in sales and, and employees. So by all those sorts of metrics, they're doing very well, despite the fact that from an operating cash flow standpoint, they don't look like they're, they're, they're doing quite as well. It's misleading in that sense. It's also much more concentrated uh, among certain industries. If you look back in, in the 1970s, um, there's a fairly broad distribution of, of industries represented in the negative operating cash flow set. Whereas in the 2000s, you see this concentrated in a lot of industries that, that, we, that make sense that they would be doing a lot of investment in intangibles, pharmaceuticals, business services, uh, chip manufacturers, medical equipment. Uh, these account for more than half of the negative operating cash flow observations. Now, they also make up a much greater proportion of the total company's debt universe, so I don't want to uh, be misleading in, in, in that sense. Right, so, what might be going on? Right, it could be the case that, that firms are just going public earlier than these earlier in, the, in, in their life cycle, uh, and so therefore, uh, we're picking up a lot of young companies that are in the early part of the life cycle stage where they're burning through a lot of cash. Okay. Certainly that's happened uh, around the dot-com uh, bubble in the, in the late 1990s. That, was, that seemed to have clearly been going on to, to some extent. That doesn't seem to be much of the story, though, for the last couple of decades. Uh, if you think about some of the work that uh, uh, Craig Deutsch and Andrew Crowley, Renee Stoltz, Kathy Kale uh, have done. What they're showing is that the number of publicly listed companies has actually fallen quite dramatically in the last couple of decades in the U.S. Uh, and what's going on is that the propensity of smaller firms to actually list has gone down. So rather than an influx of young companies that are earlier stage in life cycle, it looks like they're actually waiting longer to go public. Right? So that doesn't seem to be the primary driver of, of, of what we're observing here. Right. Secondly, it could be the opposite. It could be the fact that it's the profitable companies that are exiting, perhaps because they're the companies that are good targets of, of buyout opportunities. That also doesn't seem to be the case. Um, when we look at this data, we see roughly equal rates of, of, uh, of delisting due, due to mergers and acquisitions among positive and negative operating cash flow firms. Right. What we think is the primary driver is, is this intangible investment. Right. Let me show you a couple things that, that lead us to believe that's true. Right. If you look at this SG&A component of the income statement for the high cash flow and low cash flow firms, right, the dark line is, 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 the, is the low cash flow companies. The gray line is the, is the high cash flow companies. High cash flow companies 
aren't really doing much more in the way of intangible investment that shows up in, in the SGNA. Right? The low cash flow companies, and this is what negative operating cash flow companies show up, have exploded in terms of the proportion of their total assets that are spent on items that fall into this SGNA category. Which again is where you're going to see investments in organizational capital or knowledge capital of the type uh, that I showed before. Another way to, to think about this is right, how, what proportion of the companies would exhibit negative operating cash flow before these investments in intangibles. Right? So the top curve is the one I showed you earlier, the, the growing. Uh, propensity of, of, of companies to have <coughs> negative operating cash flow. The middle curve, the dash curve, is what percentage of companies show negative operating cash flow even before any deductions for R&D. And right? the bottom one is what proportion of the companies exhibit negative operating cash flow even before uh, any reductions for both R&D and what we call abnormal SG&A, and that's just SG&A over and above 30% of total assets, which seems to be a normal uh, level of SG&A. Right? And what you see in the bottom curve is that if we just have companies investing at normal rates by historical standards in intangible investment, we would not have this growth in negative operating cash flow firms. So it appears that this, this investment in intangibles is is in fact a, a first order driver of this trend in, in profitability. Okay, so we have an increasing number of companies that are really burning through a lot of cash uh, on a regular basis and for extended periods of time. Right, the question is, what sort of implication does that have for financing behavior? On the one hand, there's a very strong demand for liquidity among these, these firms. Right, but on the other hand, they're not generating positive profits to produce that, that liquidity. Right, so first, in terms of liquidity, one of the things that, that, you, that you observe if you look at the data is that if, if you think about the growth in average cash balances among US publicly traded companies, which is the middle curve of these all companies together, right, this has been documented many times before at this fairly substantial growth in the proportion of total assets that are held as cash. Right? If you break that down into companies that have negative cash flow and those that have positive operating cash flow, much of that trend is being driven by the negative operating cash flow firms. In fact, more than half of the growth in average cash balances can be accounted for by these negative operating cash flow firms. Now, I should be clear that I'm talking about average cash balances within firms, as opposed to aggregate cash balances. We're talking about aggregate cash balances. Those are held by a lot of big multinational <laughs> firms. Right? So we're talking about average cash balances here. Right? The other thing to notice here is if you, if you look back in the 1970s, uh, in the early part of the 1980s, right, for, the most part, for the most part, the companies with negative operating cash flow held less cash than the companies with positive operating cash flow. And that, I think, is kind of the way most of us have thought about cash balances for years. So when times are good, you stockpile some of that cash. When times are bad, you drop down on that cash. So if you look in the cross-section, those companies that are doing well have more cash than companies that are doing poor. That seems to make sense. Right? That's totally reversed right, in, the, in the last couple of decades. Companies that are holding the most cash are the companies that aren't making any money. Right? And so if we were to plot this association between cash and cash flow by decade, and that's what these different curves are, in the first two decades of, uh, of, the, of the sample that we looked at, 1970s and 1980s, you see a slight positive association between cash and cash flow more like the traditional story that, that I just gave. And if you look at, at the last couple of decades, right, it's become very U-shaped. Right? So the companies that have these extreme negative operating cash flow are the ones that are holding the largest cash balances. Right? I'm going to 
talk a little bit in a few minutes about what implications that has for, uh, for, for some of the research that we do. But I'll stick first in terms of how this squares with the traditional explanations for why firms hold so much cash and why these cash balances have grown over time. Right? One leading explanation is that this has to do with taxes, in particular the repatriation tax problem that the U.S. multinationals face. Okay. I certainly don't want to claim that that problem isn't there. It is or has been up in, uh, until recently. Um, I, but that explains really what's in the right tail of distribution. The companies that are making a lot of money, the question is do they bring that back to the U.S. and distribute it to shareholders or not? Those are not the companies that are holding the biggest cash balances in terms of cash relative to total assets. So it's not really a tax issue. And it's also hard to believe that this is an agency problem of some sort, at least not an agency problem of free cash flow, since these companies clearly don't have free cash flow uh, if, they're, if they're having these persistent operating losses. Right? It's close to a precautionary cash sort of story, but, but, but it's very different, I think, than the traditional precautionary view. Traditional precautionary view would say that you stockpile cash from past profits because you might need that cash at some point in the future. Why won't you need it? Well, because your cash flows in the future are lower than expected or growth opportunities are better than expected. And so what you're worried about is that there is the volatility of these future outcomes. Right? It's a concern about the second moment of the distribution of cash flow in investment opportunities. Right? With these negative operating cash flow firms, it's not really the second moment they're concerned about. Right? They're not concerned about whether they might need the cash at some point in the future. They know they need the cash. They need it right now. They know they're going to need it next year. And at the median, they're going to need it for three or four years now. Right? And so as a result, they have a very high demand for liquidity. Right? The problem is, it's not clear where they're going to get this liquidity from. Right? So if you think about the characteristics of these companies and their high demand for liquidity and, and their need to go outside the company to raise the funds, right, they have a lot of characteristics that we would typically associate with there being very high frictions in the process of raising external capital. Any of these stories of corporate finance that revolve around financial constraints of some sort right, are basing those constraints on frictions associated with asymmetric information or moral hazard. These companies have those things in space. And so it's going to make it very difficult for them to, to, raise, to, to raise money. Right? In a way, they're very similar to companies raising money in the private equity market, where we've seen a lot of market type of solutions to this process of raising capital, like the staging of finance and contractual solutions to these frictions that, that exist for these types of companies. In a lot of ways, I think that's what we're starting to see in the public capital market as well, or at least for these publicly traded companies who are, who are, who are raising funds. Right, so, let me talk about a couple of these. Right? How has external financing changed as we've had this evolution in the types of companies that comprise the publicly traded universe? Right? One is that we don't see as much in the way of corporate bond issuance, right? most likely due to the, the lack of, of pledgeability of, of, of the assets uh, for these types of companies. We do see the companies raising equity more frequently than we have in the past which in some ways is a little bit odd when you think of the large fixed costs of, of, of raising money in, in the capital market. As, as I'll show you momentarily, they're raising it differently uh, to get around some of those, those costs. Uh, we do tend to see a little bit more stockpiling of the proceeds from this equity financing. So companies are not just raising equity because they have a specific project in mind and then uh, they're just consuming all that equity, all the proceeds from that equity. They're stockpiling some of it for use, but they're not stockpiling, stockpiling it for long because they're burning through this cash very, very rapidly. I mean, what we're seeing is that an increasing proportion of companies, publicly traded companies, that are raising equity financing, they're actually raising. 
raising the money in the private equity market. All right, so let me show you a couple of figures to, to, to demonstrate some of those, those overall views. Right? If you look, let's focus first on the dash line in, in this figure. Right? These are characteristics of companies that are, that are raising equity financing, either public or private. Over time, right? so if if you look at the ratio of of, uh, of cash flow to assets, which is the dash line, right? Equity issuers up until about the mid 1980s, where we had this explosion in the proportion of companies with with operating losses. Prior to that time, your typical equity issuer was a relatively relatively profitable firm, right? Once we, see, once we get to about the mid-1980s, and ever since then, the typical equity issuer actually has negative cash flow to asset ratios. Right? In recent years, pretty large in terms of the, of, of the negative cash flow. Right? At the same time, the solid, the solid curve is depicting the cash balance of equity issuers for the year immediately following the, their equity financing. These cash balances have, have grown quite a bit over time, right, which is a reflection somewhat of the stockpiling that, that's taking place. Right, so a typical equity issuer uh, is a negative cash flow firm, but conditional on raising the money, right, they're stockpiling a lot of the proceeds as, as cash, at least temporarily. Right. How are they actually raising this equity financing? A number of people have documented the fact that there's been an increasing rate private investments in, in public equity over time. Right? What I'm showing you here is that a lot of that is being driven by these negative cash flow firms. Now, if you look on the left part of, of, of this table, it, even back to 1995, roughly three quarters of the equity financings that are taking place among negative cash flow firms are of the SEO variety. Right. Once we get down to, to, to the last decade or so, right, we're seeing more than three quarters of the equity financing of publicly traded companies with negative cash flow are actually private equity finances. Right. There's been a growth through private equity financings of public companies with positive cash flow as well, but not nearly as dramatic. So this trend towards private equity financing appears to be driven by this, this set of companies that are, that are showing negative, negative cash flow. Right? So it looks like they're raising equity frequently and they're stockpiling the proceeds. I alluded to the fact that this is temporary. Right? If you sort of layer on uh, the characteristics of these companies, both the rate at which they're burning through cash and the frequency with which they're raising equity financing and how much equity financing they're raising, you can sort of simulate the distribution of their cash balance over time. And we have to sort of simulate this because they're burning through this within a year and raising equity financing more than once a year once we get to the, to the 2000s. And you can see is what's going on is that there's a huge intra-firm variation in the cash balance of these negative cash flow firms. And so this, we don't, I don't want to send the message that these are the high cash balance companies. They are at points in time. They raise a lot of equity and stockpile a lot of it, but they burn through it so rapidly that within a year, their cash balance is moving all over the place. It's highly volatile uh, cash balance. OK, so now in the, in, in the last couple of minutes, let me just turn to what I'm calling some other implications of this, this, these trends in the nature of publicly traded companies. Right, one that I alluded to earlier has to do with this, this uh, U-shaped association now between cash and cash flow. Right, a lot of work that, that takes place in, in corporate finance involves estimating what we think of as normal, and some people even refer to as optimal, levels of, of cash holdings. Right? And these models are typically linear models that relate the cash balance to a set of firm characteristics, one of which is typically the cash flow of, of the firm that's involved. Right? What these patterns are suggesting is that those types of models are becoming increasingly misspecified. 
And somehow we're going to have to account for this nonlinearity in the association between cash and cash flow if we're going to get reasonable estimates of what's a normal level of cash for, for a given firm to have. That's a fairly easy fix, so that's not uh, terribly complicated, I don't think. And a second category of tests that I think some of this is relevant for are tests that are oftentimes conducted in corporate finance that are trying to detect whether certain policies or certain uh, actions that have been taken have some real consequences for the firm. And those real consequences are typically couched in terms of whether that particular action or policy uh, has an impact on levels of investment. And so generally there's some idea involved that this policy either made the company more constrained or less constrained and allowed them to invest or constrain them uh, for, from investing. Well, that's becoming a little more difficult to, to handle as well empirically in the sense that what we think of, invest, of uh, investment is really changing over time. Right? As companies are increasingly turning towards intangible investment, we have to consider that when we're doing empirical work that's trying to detect these, these real effects. It's not just what's the effect on, the, on capital expenditures. Right? There's R&D, and even more complicated, there's this organizational capital stuff that shows up in SG&A. How do we tease out which, what part of the SG&A is really intangible investment that might be affected by these policies or not? That's a much more difficult problem, I think. Right? It's one that's going to be increasingly in, in, important. Uh, along the same lines, uh, there's a lot of papers that, will, that try to get at whether companies are being uh, appropriately sensitive to growth opportunities when allocating capital. Right? In some sense, that's got problems on both sides of it. Right? Because again, you have to think about well, what do you mean in terms of investment and are you measuring the full set of investment correctly, but even on the other side, it's, it's not clear that we can do, we've never done a great job, I think, of, of estimating the marginal Q of, of projects, but it's gotten a lot worse, I think, with, with investment in intangible capital. Much more difficult to identify. So, for example, if you think about a company that's doing a lot of investing in, in intangibles, right, that is shrinking if any, at all that's equal, that's shrinking the size of, of, the, of the book assets of the company. But if it's creating value, then obviously market value is off. Right? So these companies that invest a lot in intangibles have very high market to book ratios as a result. That does not necessarily mean that the, the benefit of the next dollar spent is particularly high in, in those firms. And so if you're taking the market to book ratio is some indicator of, of the marginal Q of the next dollar that's spent, that's becoming increasingly misspecified as well. That's not a simple problem uh, to handle either. Right. Uh, a third category of implications has to do with uh, some of the stories that you see in, in, the, in the press and even in, in some of our own articles in, in academic finance about the extent to which investment is being affected by managerial myopia. And this, this focus on, on short-term earnings. And the idea has always been that you know, managers are going to be reluctant to invest in things that reduce earnings uh, in the short term because they're, they're, they're punished for, for doing so. Now, as I look at this data, this spectacular growth in intangible investment, this growth in the proportion of companies that uh, exhibit negative operating cash flow and it turns out to be negative income as well in a lot of cases. It's a little difficult for me to believe that this, this, uh, this uh, push from, from myopia is really all that strong. Now, having said that, to be fair, when you see these companies raising money in the capital market, it is frequently not the public capital. So there still could be some influence there, but I guess I've not seen so far that, that there's a net impact on these companies that is negative in terms of holding them back from, from being able to, to undertake uh, good opportunities. 
Uh, fourth, this would be more of an accounting uh, sort, of, sort of topic, but there's some recent studies that I've seen that have documented the information content of earnings announcements has declined over time. I suspect that's fairly strongly tied to this trend as well. It, it, showing negative profitability used to be a pretty strong signal of, of problems. That's no longer the case. Uh, so it's, it's not as clear what to conclude uh, from the measured earnings. Right? And finally, I think what we'll, we'll most likely be seeing is a fair number of studies that, that, that look into the distribution of stock returns as well as, as uh, operating earnings over time. If these companies are investing a lot in intangibles and incurring a lot of losses in the near term, the winners in this are eventually going to come out with, with fairly strong profitability and, and positive stock returns and look more like the Amazons of, of the world. Um, so arguably you're going to see more of the lottery type of, of uh, outcomes than, than what we've seen in, in, in prior distributions. And so let me just try to, to, to wrap up with, with a couple of points. Right, one is that I think what we've seen is that there's been a secular shift in the underlying economics of how companies do business. Right? And that's forced them in some ways to, to shift the way they invest away from tangible sorts of investment opportunities to, to intangibles. This has corresponded then with fairly dramatic shifts in, in profitability and in financing patterns, which I think open the door to a lot of opportunities for people like us to, to conduct the research on, on uh, a lot of different and interesting subjects. And so let me just stop there and uh, happy to take any questions.